Hi there. Before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to make a quick plug for our upcoming peer-to-peer professional forum conference in Philadelphia, February 21st through the 23rd. If you have been enjoying this podcast, you won't want to miss out. This conference is your opportunity to be a part of conversations just like the one you're about to hear with your peers, tackling the topics that most impact your work and your organization. The conference includes interactive workshops and breakouts, inspiring keynote speakers, and networking opportunities to help you build a professional community that can sustain you year round. For all the details, head on over to our website at peertopeerforum.com. And as a special incentive for our podcast listeners, you can use the code SOAPBOX, all one word, during registration for an extra $50 off between now and January 31st. See you in Philly. Welcome back to the P2P Soapbox. I'm your host and P2P BFF, Marcy Maxwell, and we have an exciting episode lined up for you today. Remember back in 2014, when every professional fundraiser was bombarded with the same question? Oh yes, I'm talking about what's the next ice bucket challenge? I know everyone at home is raising their hand. This wildly successful viral, peer-to-peer fundraising campaign benefiting the ALS Association not only spawned a ton of copycats, some better than others, but it also pushed our industry into a state of evolution and innovation. And innovation has continued to be one of the hottest buzzwords in our industry, as we're always on the hunt for that next million dollar idea, or maybe make it 10 million after adjusting for inflation. But in a world that's constantly changing with ever-shifting technology and donor expectations and limited resources in terms of staffing and donor dollars, staying ahead of the innovation curve can be a real challenge without a dedicated team. That's why I'm thrilled to introduce you to our guest for today, the amazing Carla Warner, Carla is the Senior Director of Revenue Innovation at Share Our Strength, the nonprofit behind the No Kid Hungry campaign. But before we dive into our chat, let me give you a little sneak peek into Carla's world and her organization. Share Our Strength is on a mission to end hunger and poverty, period. The No Kid Hungry campaign is tackling childhood hunger by launching and improving programs that provide healthy food to all kids. Carla joined the Share Our Strength team 12 years ago, initially working on individual giving and membership. But in 2015, she took on the incredible task of launching their revenue innovation team. Her team is all about piloting new and innovative fundraising opportunities, and they've had major success with Share Our Strengths P2P initiatives like Friendsgiving, Stream, and their newest innovation, Get Fit. During our chat, we'll uncover the secrets and success stories of Carla's revenue innovation team, from how they incubate new ideas to make them operational and ultimately find them a permanent home. We'll dive deep into the world of peer-to-peer fundraising as the driving force behind their new initiatives. We'll explore how Share Our Strength made the case for this dedicated revenue innovation team and how Carla's team approaches entering new markets and new audiences. We'll also discuss the significance of trend spotting and the importance of flexibility when trying out new strategies. So without further ado, let's jump into my conversation with Carla Warner from Share Our Strength. Hey, Carla, welcome to the P2P Soapbox. So happy to have you on. Thank you, Marcy. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I'm so excited about with this podcast is that I get the chance to spend 30 minutes to an hour with some of my favorite people in the industry. And I feel like we just officially met not that long ago, but I already love our conversations. And so I'm so happy to have you uh, joining us. 
Thank you. I feel the same way. And, you know, as I, as I said at the peer to peer conference, which I love so much, like if you need me, you let me know. So it's, it's an honor to be here with you. I know. I always tell people you say that I'm going to make you regret it. <laughs> All right. So Carla, so I said, we, we haven't known each other for that long and I've given our listeners, you know, a little bit of your bio, but I would love to just hear from you, you know, your, both your personal and really your professional journey that led you to this role as Senior Director of Revenue Innovation at Share Our Strength and the No Kid Hungry campaign. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that opportunity. Well, on a personal note, food has always played a really important part in my life. I grew up in an Italian-American family where food was a way that we connected with one one another. It was what we talked about at weddings. It was the way that we got through funerals, milestone celebrations, and, you know, the many, many average afternoons I spent in my grandmother's kitchen. It was our love language, and it was a way to bolster us when times were hard. Um, and when I became a mother myself, it was really important for me that that tradition lived on. Um, but as a, a relatively new mother, I, I learned that there were millions of kids in the country who were facing hunger. And it was a statistic that I was shocked and heartbroken to hear because no one would ever imagine that in a wealthy nation that we would have this issue with hunger in America. Um, so I knew immediately when I learned those statistics that I had to do something about it. Um, and given that our organization, Share Our Strength, was built on this concept that everyone has a strength to share, I was really eager to lend my professional experience and my degree in marketing and, of course, my passion for food and feeding people to support the cause. So I started actually with our Taste in the Nation event. There was a culinary events that we used to do across the country. Now we have far fewer post-COVID, but I volunteered uh, at that event and just fell in love with the organization and, and what it was doing and found out there was a position um, that was open on the team to become a permanent member of the Share Our Strength family. And that was 12 and a half years ago. And it's been an amazing journey ever since. You know, I, I have worn many hats in my tenure here, um, but I have to say with full certainty that my current role working with our co-founder on Revenue Innovation is by far my favorite. And it just feels like a real honor to be a part of this team doing the work that we do. I always love hearing stories about how people got into their nonprofit roles and the amazing amount of people that come from volunteering. I know that's how I got my start as well. I started mm -hmm. off volunteering, uh, doing fundraising in college, and then ended up in a full-time role with that organization just a couple months after graduation. And never did I think that's what I would still be doing. It's amazing. Yeah. The journey. Uh, a couple decades yes. later. <laughs> so, so, Carla, I am so intrigued by kind of your new role and this focus that your organization has on revenue innovation, because, you know, that really requires a focus on innovation really requires just a level of risk tolerance that I think can be really hard for nonprofits because of the almighty donor dollars that we focus so much on. So I'd love to hear a little bit about, about the team and really why the organizations decided to build it how it got started, how has it changed over time? Tell me everything. You got it. So I think what we're doing at Share Strength is pretty special. You know, one of our core values is to drive innovation. But for us, it isn't one of those buzzwords. You know, there are a lot of words that I think, you know, organizations and companies tend to toss around that are sort of hot and trendy. But we really wanted to embody innovation across the organization, both from a fundraising and a programmatic perspective. Um, well, I believe that we truly are an innovative organization and my brilliant colleagues are innovating all the time. There was a point about eight years ago when we were trying to test some new things on the backs of existing teams. And it was, it was hard to do, right? Because we've all got so much on our plates, capacity and limited budgets and whatnot. So our co-founder, Debbie Shore, made a case to put dedicated capacity towards true innovation. So it was at that time that our small but mighty revenue innovation team was born. I was uh, managing the development team at the time and was so excited when I heard this role was open um, and immediately jumped and, and very lucky that that Debbie entrusted me to, to join her in leading the charge on that. Now, what does it mean to have a revenue innovation team exactly? Well, one, it means that our very tiny team of three, which is myself, Debbie, and our colleague, Gloria, are all 100% focusing on innovative new ways to raise funds for the kids we serve. So really, our process is we come up with new ideas, we pilot them, hopefully we prove the concept to be successful, 
And then we eventually transition them to existing revenue teams. So nothing that we build is supposed to remain with us for for life, so to speak. Um, But what it also means, and you touched on this, Marcy, is that Debbie and our entire executive team are behind creating a team that they really trust us to test things and take those risks. So, you know, when you look at other teams that have huge revenue goals, you know, and any nonprofit, you know, worker will tell you that you you hit a goal. And of course, the question is, how do you raise more next year, right? That's right. just sort of the, the nature of how we work. So when you're constantly striving for that, it's hard to take those risks. Plus, you have a lot on your plate. There are capacity challenges and then budgets that you have to really make sure you're maximizing, not only to be true to donor intent, but also to make sure that you're getting the greatest ROI. So it doesn't mean that my small and mighty team is given millions of dollars to launch new ideas, but it means that we're given a dedicated budget to test and the ability to take risks and and the grace to fail in a way that I think other teams are not allowed. So example, I think one of the, the boldest innovations we've tested was our Stream for No Kid Hungry initiative. And that, that we launched about four years ago. So Stream for No Kid Hungry is all around this concept of engaging live streamers, creators, whatever you want to call them, m- mostly on Twitch, right? On the live stream fundraising platform, Twitch, that have proven that they can raise extraordinary amounts of money when they are live streaming content that they love. So whether they're gaming or cooking or whatever it may be, when they decide to dedicate some of that stream time to fundraise for charity, real magic happens. And we knew that that, that there were others very successfully doing that in the nonprofit space. But it was very new to nonprofits, for, to most of us, right? This concept of live stream fundraising. And we certainly had very little expertise internally about live, gaming, live streaming and the gaming culture as a whole, right? Right. So that something like that would have been very difficult for our peer-to-peer team to build while they were managing everything that was on their plate. So because we had this dedicated capacity, we were able to dig into it in a really immersive innovation approach by really like going to all of these events. You know, I, I've shared my journey with many as we were building this initiative. Um, and the beginning was hard. Again, I was I was a, in my early 40s going to live streaming and gaming conferences and conventions and trying to figure out what was this culture like? You know, how did this all work? Like what, how do they talk? Where do, where do they talk? How do I meet yeah. them where they're at? totally foreign to us, but I was 100% dedicated to figuring that out. And so while there was some early failures, my exec team didn't say, oh, you know what? We tried this one or two initiatives. It didn't work. We're pulling the plug. I was able to say to them, listen, we've tried this. This is what I've learned. I still see great opportunity in this. Give me some time to take what I've learned and continue to innovate on this. And they gave me the grace to do that. And since then, we've built a very successful live stream fundraising program. It raises over a million a year. And we've since transitioned that under our peer-to-peer team. And we're able to make a case to add two new amazing individuals to that team to lead the charge on that, both of which are live stream experts. Um, and it's I, I hope it will continue to grow. Um, but really, as a whole, when I think back of our where we started and where we are, um, you know, as we continue to test and pilot and transition these ideas, we're also evaluating our process. I think when we started, and anyone who has an innovation team will probably share a similar experience, a lot of people internally had some reservations, right? Especially when we tossed around ideas that felt close to home on things that they might yeah. be working on, right? Um, but, and oh, and also I think it's worth mentioning that our team does not live on the, the revenue slash fundraising team. We actually oh, are under, it's very interesting under our co-founder, but it's because Debbie is such an innovative person and, and this is her passion. So under her leadership, we've been able to do some great things, but how we intersect with and collaborate with the fundraising team is so critical. And I think it took us having to prove some concepts to say, hey, we're not just over here talking about a bunch of stuff that won't go anywhere, but we're actually building initiatives And building initiatives that had value to their work, right? That we are building things that our corporate partnership team can sell or building themes that things that major donors can get invited to, building themes, things that could lead to more donor opportunity, right? To our general uh, donor base. So over time, we've proven to them that this is possible. And we're really, really 
figuring out how to collaborate better and really take the biz- the the vision from just innovating on an island to being really collaborative on how we innovate together. Now, I think that's so great because I imagine a lot of our listeners that have been in the nonprofit space for a while have have been tapped with trying something new or starting mm-hmm. something new on top of everything else ha- they have on their plate. I know for one <laughs> uh, that I was one of those uh, launching a brand new multi-million dollar program on top of everything we else we had on the plate. And it was a challenge. And so I think what I'm excited to see is more organizations having teams like this and investing in the one, two, three resources in order to also save the the sanity and the workload and just the performance of the team that is really working on the core book of business so that they don't get distracted by this. So I think that is, I think, and hope that more organizations will continue to follow. So, you know, when I think about innovation, so you're talking about the Stream for No Kid Hungry initiative, which was, I mean, that's a significant new project. And I think, you know, sometimes innovation is really disruptive. It's this brand new program that's going to need a home and a team and branding. And sometimes it's just a little renovation, right, that solves a problem. What else has come out of your team? What are some of the ideas that um, you've worked on? Have you, you know, spill, uh, filled new spaces in your portfolio? You know, are you solving problems? You know, what have been some of the results that you've seen? Definitely. So, you know, it's interesting because I think when we launched the the team, we really were thinking about big innovation, right? So like, what are the things we've never done before that could add a ton of new supporters to our cause? And that's still our primary goal, right? Like I'm, while I hope that some of the things we do can re-engage existing donors, like what our teams don't need is another way to like sort of rob Peter to pay Paul, right? Like we want to come up with really exciting new ideas that bring new people to uh, the work that we do. And again, with a, with a greater focus initially on brand new ideas, although I think there's opportunity and we could talk more about this to bring new people to existing ideas, that renovation piece that you talked about it. But since we launched the team, we have tested or explored five different ideas over sort of the eight years that we've been doing this. And four of them have like truly been launched as new initiatives. One, I think, died due to COVID. And and we just kind of made the decision that there wasn't a lot of energy behind it anyway, and just reprioritized. But you know, the first thing we launched was our Friendsgiving for No Kid Hungry initiative. And this just essentially leveraged this hot new trend that people were getting together for Thanksgiving with their friends in addition to or in lieu of celebrating with their family. So inherent in the name Friendsgiving, we thought, well, wow, if this is a really hot trend and Friendsgiving just kind of makes it feel like you're giving, right, with your friends, we basically got a trademark on nonprofit giving around Friendsgiving and built a campaign to pull people together to say, hey, if you're going to host a Friendsgiving anyway, why not leverage it as an opportunity to give back to kids this, this holiday season? And this to me, Marcy, was was really more of a renovation and that it would it was essentially a peer-to-peer fundraising campaign, right? But it was a peer-to-peer fundraising campaign that was built on a hot trend. And so we got the blessing, so to speak, from our existing peer-to-peer team that says, hey, do you mind if we test this out? And so we went out, and I say we, meaning Gloria and I, under Debbie's leadership, and we built this campaign. Um, at the time, because it was our first one, we weren't getting a ton of attention and support from our colleagues only because again the the concept of the team was new and they had really really big important things that they were working on so they didn't have the opportunity to lend a lot of capacity so we were kind of wearing a lot of hats as i as i always say to gloria we were the butchers the bakers and the candlestick makers <laughs> you know <laughs> writing it. the copy and building the website and you know we had to you know get some consulting help and of course leaned on our internal team to say can you look at this before we launch it so we don't go rogue but um, to had to do a lot of it ourselves. But I think after doing a first successful pilot with Friendsgiving and showing, oh, well, people actually want to do this, like we're getting a lot of people to sign up, then our team started paying attention, right? And saying, oh, this is really interesting. Let's talk about how much capacity we could lend to this. So that was really sort of the launching point for us to try to get attention from our colleagues across the organization. And suddenly it was a sponsor ball campaign that we had pretty big brands interested in being a part of. And so really, again, 
based on our process, once that initiative was proven successful, right? Um, I think when we transitioned it, it was raising about $500,000 a year. Um, and that one was very easy for us to transition to the peer-to-peer team because again, it was your typical peer-to-peer approach. But from there is when we moved to this live stream concept. And so although it was peer-to-peer in nature, anyone who's worked on live stream understands that the learning curve is far greater and the approach to engaging this community was very different different from our typical peer to peer strategy so you know where you might do your typical direct marketing with ads and emails and whatnot the live stream content creator community they don't want they're not reading your emails they want you to meet them where they're at and it was a lot of one to one relationship building so suddenly i needed to understand what Twitch was, right? Not a not a rapid body movement. There's actually a platform <laughs> called Twitch where people go and live stream for hours and hours and hours, right? And people go and watch others play video games. And so this was like unbelievable to me that this existed. Um, and of course, thrilling to me that this also existed as an incredible new way to fundraise. So I had to understand suddenly what Twitch was and Now I needed to be talking to people more on Twitter than on, you know, some of the other uh, channels that we were used to or Discord, which is the primary way where a lot of these creators and gamers were communicating on that social platform. Add on that there's emojis that mean all sorts of different things. And I was, I was way, way out of my element. Um, so Especially I those that, food emojis. Oh my they gosh, mean right? different things. <laughs> and I wanted to be so hip. I wanted to be so cool. And I remember working with a creator who was helping me out on some things, really, really smart, amazing person, but also was not afraid to be like, you're not one of us and you don't get it. <laughs> and Love I was it. not afraid to agree with that, right? Um, but what I brought to the table was, of course, my enthusiasm and love of the mission. And then when I was able, able to identify someone who understood the space better than I did to partner with me on it, then together I felt like we were unstoppable because that person managed our community and could talk the talk and knew what to post and how to talk. It wasn't like, you know, embarrassing like old lady posts that I was, that I, that I continue to this day to do because it's me and I, and I embrace my, my current self, but that he was able to really understand and guide us on how we were managing that community. And that was sort of the key to the success was to say, okay, what do we know? What do we need? How do we grow this? Um, And it was really exciting to see over... And of course, I learned a ton over the the years that we worked on it. Um, And it remained with us a lot longer because it really was more of an innovation piece, right? It It was a new audience. It was a new tactic for fundraising. It was something that we had never done before, but it was also something that many others nonprofits in the space had never done. Um, and it was really changing over. I mean, even when we launched the program to today, rapidly. it changed rapidly. So we were constantly reevaluating. Like we were like, oh, we have the sweet sauce. We know how to do this. And then something would happen. We're like, the sauce is no longer sweet. We need a new sweet sauce. So it was a lot of being nimble and just trying to figure out, um, you know, what, where people, again, meeting people where they were at, that was our number one. Um, and then, you know, we can, we continue to innovate and find new initiatives. Um, you know, we tested a bake event that worked with some of the current people in our network that were like, you know, we work a lot with the culinary industry. So we had all these amazing bakers who did a multi-hour live stream of fundraising event. That wasn't a huge fundraiser. So we very quickly transitioned that to our amazing culinary team um, to continue to evolve and build. Um, But then we transitioned to our Get Fit for No Good Hungry initiative, which is what we're currently working on. And that to me, Marcy, is of all the things that we've worked on, I think has the most opportunity. What we're doing is we're really mobilizing the fitness, health, and wellness community behind our mission. And I look at our history as an organization and say, we have done so much with the culinary industry because this concept that chefs who feed people are amazing partners in our mission to make sure kids are fed. And I 100% buy into that still. I also know that the culinary industry has been through a lot since the pandemic and that we have to be understanding and supportive of their limitations in in this day and age. And so this is a great example about why innovation is so important. We know now that health and wellness and the focus on that is at an all-time high. And so we also believe that people who pay attention to their health and their wellness really understand the importance that kids get the meals they need to grow up happy, healthy, and strong. So I think this is the next big industry for us to build 
huge opportunity on to really, really take us further faster in our mission to end childhood hunger in America. And I'm so excited about what we have in the pipeline to grow it. I think one of the things that really stands out to me about what you're talking about with your launching into different communities, you know, the same way launching into the live streaming community felt really foreign to a lot of fundraisers. And you took the time to find the connections, to learn more, to admit what you did know, what you didn't know. I think that's so true to any new community that you have to get into, not even just a technology community. It could be a new city that you're moving into and walking into it and saying, I know nothing about Des Moines, Iowa. So I need to find the leaders who are baked into this community who can help me establish what we're trying to do or the same thing in the fitness industry. I can recall a program that I was a part of years ago where it was with a fitness organization and they basically were like, you need to become a member of our organization because you clearly don't understand how we operate. Uh, And so they started inviting us to their gym, inviting us to do things. And it totally changed my way of thinking about the program because you were actually able to say, oh, how they communicate is totally different. What motivates them is totally different. And so I think just having the dedicated time as an innovation team to really dig in on all of that, I think is so is so fantastic. Yeah. And it's one of the things I love most about my work and how I feel like I am am appropriate to share my strength because I love connecting with people, right? Like I love getting out there. It's building relationships with folks. Like I can't even tell you the joy that the stream community brought me in, in the peak of us managing that, you know, being on people's late night live streams, just going and doing all of these crazy, fun and amazing things to unlock meals for the kids we serve or for, you know, the fitness people who are, you know, doing push-ups and, and all of these incredible physical, um, you know, things that are way beyond my capacity um, and, and talking about their commitment and their passion for the work that we do. That brings me so such joy, but it's also something that I really enjoy doing and understanding people and seeing um, where where they're at. And Debbie talks about this a lot about early champions and concentric circles. Everything that we have done as an organization, we could probably point back to one, two, three individuals who believed in the idea with us and helped us build it. Whether it was you know early people in our dying days in the restaurant industry who said yes. I want to be able to help you engage restaurants. I'm a restaurant owner. Let me tell my friends about it. Or our Chef Cycle initiative where we had one chef come to us and say, I want to ride my bike across the country and raise funds for No Get Hungry. We said, oh, maybe not across the country. Let's do it, you know, New York to DC. But then he brought in a bunch of his friends and it just ripples from there. And like you said, you bring people close to the experience. You allow them to feel like the heroes that they are. And then it just grows. And it's it, for me, it's the most rewarding part of being a part of this mission is to get people to share their strength with us. I love it. Now, Carla, so we are the P2P soapbox. And I, you know, I will always stand on my soapbox to talk about how peer-to-peer fundraising is such a vital and critical type of fundraising. But I can't help but notice that Several of your ideas, many of your ideas through revenue innovation are leveraging peer to peer. So can you talk about this? Absolutely. And frankly, all of them, if I if I'm thinking back correctly, are peer to peer. And (laughs) truth be told, it wasn't intentional. We weren't you know, we're not the revenue innovation peer to peer team. Um, But I think it's fair to say, and I know you'll agree to me that peer to peer is just an amazing way to engage people in your mission, right? It's one thing to say, hey, donate. It's another thing to get those champions to tell the people in their circle that they're doing something they care about. I also think that because live stream has been such a big trend and a a huge focus of my team's work that it, it also inherently is peer to peer driven so i think you know it's an effective tactic and i think live stream is um is is proving it to be even more effective because people are in real time engaging folks in live stream commenting interacting really gaining momentum that can be incredibly powerful um and you know as we transition we talk about sort of how it opens opportunity for other teams Obviously, we're transitioning these pieces one by one to our peer-to-peer team. 
And as I mentioned earlier, it's allowing them to bring new audiences, right? So now the peer-to-peer team that you had what I would say is sort of the typical demographic for our No Get Hungry donor is now engaging even more fitness enthusiasts, is now engaging this huge live stream you know, creator gaming community. Um, we've got bakers engaging with us in new ways, but it's also a way for us to say, Hey, maybe ages ago you hosted a bake sale and our bake sale isn't really a big thing anymore, but make sure you come and check out our bake a or Hey, maybe you're not baking as much because you've really embraced fitness and you're in on now living a, a really <laughs> healthy lifestyle. Did you know that we have get fit for no get hungry, right? So trying to figure out that's part of the process too is now we're was we're building and um transitioning these ideas. What is not only the journey of the transition internally, but what is the journey of the people who either fundraised or donated to these initiatives that were growing? Um, I will also say it's lended value to other teams like all of these influencers. We had 43 fitness, health, and wellness influencers do our Get Fit initiative this past January. Those people are now advocates of the work we do and brand ambassadors. So we are thinking a lot about our social team and our champions team to say, hey, are you guys doing anything that you want to build awareness? Because we've got these amazing champions in the fitness space who have huge followings who are happy to tell the story of No Kid Hungry. Um, and of course, all the sponsorship engagement that we've been able to open up with these new initiatives has pretty darn been pretty darn exciting too. Oh my gosh. That's a, it's a lot of rapid change, which is really <laughs> exciting. Uh, probably a little stressful. And you know, I think as, as we all know, innovation across our peer-to-peer industry and really the world you know, has been in overdrive since the start of the pandemic. And so, so much of this great work you're talking about has taken place over the last three, three and a half years, you know, where we've seen peer-to-peer change faster than it ever has. So how has your team's approach to innovation changed since the beginning of the pandemic? Has it evolved? You know, what lessons have you learned about this rapid fire need for innovation? It's a great question. You know, I think in its simplicity, we have learned more than ever through this experience how important it is to have this revenue innovation team, right? I mean, I think our our focus, and you know, in addition to opening up doors to new relationships is to really understand how we meet people where they are at. This world has been through so much. People are hurting. Mental health is a is a crisis in this country. It's it's a really difficult time to be a human, right? At any age, right? And, um, but there's so much hope in the world too. And I think that we all know that giving people purpose and meaning in their lives can really help um, us have hope that the world is is going to be okay. And so understanding um, where people are at and how do we engage them in ways that feel authentic to them that aren't more of a lift than they're willing to give or capable of giving, um, and it takes time to understand that, right? Like to understand what is current consumer behavior and how do we innovate in a way to build these new fundraising opportunities that get people excited and engaged. Um, you know, we have to understand as an organization, but certainly my team in particular, that what worked yesterday might not work tomorrow. And it's hard to do that when you're managing large programs. You know, we have a, a culinary team that was putting on these incredible culinary events And then suddenly the world shut down and we couldn't do culinary events anymore. And that was really hard. And they buckled down. And and as I said, they were thinking innovative um, with their, you know, putting their innovative caps on and trying to figure out what do we do in this moment? But that's a huge, huge, huge challenge to pivot on. Well, thankfully, we had this innovation team that was already building a live stream initiative. And when the world shuts down, everybody went to live stream. So we were able to not only take what we built and we learned leaving leading up to the pandemic, but say, okay, what does live stream look like during a pandemic, right? Like, yes, it's a much bigger opportunity. And how do we just like leverage, you know, pull all the levers to make sure that we're maximizing this opportunity as a team of two um, and and manage all these incoming opportunities and partner with our corporate sh- partnerships team. Like it was a lot, but thank God we had it, right? We were there and we were ready. And again, had the capacity to dedicate towards this. And then as the world opened up, live streaming changed again, right? So we went from live streaming sort of on an uptick, but not everybody doing it to it blowing up and all these, you know, concerts and comedy shows and uh, baking and all that was happening. And now people want to be back out in the world. So again, we're being required to be nimble and flexible to say, 
what does live stream look like today? And so, you know, just to end where I started, having a team that's capable of doing that and can learn and grow and pivot um, has, I think, served us well as an organization. But I also think we are really starting to understand too how much we can better collaborate with existing teams. Like we have seen over time that if a lot of the stuff that we're doing is opening doors to more corporate partnerships, to major donor opportunities, that we really need to be thinking about how we're collaborating better And so one simple fix is during our planning process, instead of Gloria, Debbie, and I going and saying, okay, we know this is the trend, let's build something. I sat down and I read the business plans of the entire revenue team and said, okay, now I see what the priorities are for our corporate team. Now I understand what the priorities are for our culinary team. What can I do with the things that I'm working on or beyond to help them meet their goals? Because I know that the partnership across the organization is so critical And that is like really allowed us to do some very, very cool things. And we're having some amazing conversations about Get Fit in that industry and how instead of us just doing what what we've historically done, which was a month long live stream fundraising campaign with influencers, we're now talking about initiatives beyond that, that engage corporate partners, that offer more corporate partnership uh, fundraising opportunities. We're talking about luxury retreat events for major donors, um, all sorts of incredible new things that we can do to leverage this new army of, of fitness, wellness, and health folks to help all of the revenue teams go further faster. And it's such an exciting time for me to be in this role because I really think we're gonna unlock a lot of doors and raise a lot of money for kids in the years ahead. So it sounds like every organization needs a Carla. That's what I'm hearing. Every organization needs a Carla. Um, This was so fantastic. I love hearing all of these ideas. Um, It's really inspiring. I think the work that y'all are doing to tackle this massive problem in our country. Um, So if people are as excited as I am and they want to learn more about Share Our Strength and the No Kid Hungry campaign and all of your great initiatives, where, where can they find that information? I'm so glad you asked. So you, you can find us on pretty much any social media channel with at No Kid Hungry. Um, and if you want to go to our website, which obviously tells a lot more about who we are, what we do, how we feed kids, you can go to nokidhungry.org. Awesome. And we will have all of that linked in the show notes, as well as some uh, information in case you want to connect uh, with our dear friend, Carla. So uh, we'll wrap that up. But Carla, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your your approach to innovation. Uh, And we're just so uh, delighted to have you on the podcast. Oh, Marcy, thank you so much. It was such a joy. And I'm, you know, I'm always here to, to support you and your amazing efforts. And of course, love to share our journey with others in hopes that we can help uh, other organizations move their missions further faster. So I, I feel really honored to be a part of this work and to have joined you today. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right. Well, bye, my friend. Bye. The P2P Soapbox is produced in partnership with True Story FM, engineering by Pete Wright. Music this week is by Tsabutan. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, we hope you'll consider doing just that for our show. But the best thing that you can do to support the P2P Soapbox is simply to share the show with a friend or colleague. Thank you for listening.